Hey, our band ran out yesterday to Bay Mignette and, and played for the Veterans Home up there, and they loved it. I saw the pictures. What a blessing that man, is. Man, that was amazing. Yes. That was amazing. Hey, I want to uh, thank everybody for coming. I'm John Mason Smith. Uh, I'm on staff here at the Florabama Church. Uh, if you don't have a program, this guy right here, wait a minute, will give me 20 of them. <laughs> All right, if you don't have a program, you're going to need one. I'm going to refer to it a couple of times here during these announcements, but just raise your hand up and they'll get you one. Hey, um, we have uh, information tables on both sides of the room. If you're a first-time guest, thank you for coming. We hope you, uh, you feel welcome. Uh, there's a place you can get more information at those tables. Obviously, they say the word info on them, but you can find them. We have guest uh, bags for first-time guests. Uh, we have a saying where it's okay to be not okay by that we mean you're okay just as you are you're welcome in this church uh there's no barrier you have to cross we're considering considering you one of ours and uh, we're going to put you to work right away you watch us <laughs> just because you're here you think you're getting off light no so i'm just visiting in the back well we're going to put you to work all kinds of way today starting with this so we uh we have this thing called christmas that happens every year you've probably heard of it if you haven't started shopping yet, it's uh, not very far away. Yeah. Kind of been putting that off. Eight days. Yeah, eight days. We're listening. Uh, but before that, we're going to do what's called a service Saturday. So this is uh, so this is Sunday. So this coming Saturday, we'd, I'd invite everyone to come back here. We're actually going to do Christmas services this week um, on so next Sunday out on the beach. So we're going to have a giant tent out there with sides on it. And uh, we're going to move all these chairs out there. And we'll be setting up a couple of other things, a stage and stuff. And we just need some help. If you want to come help with that, um, come meet some new people. Have a lot of fun. 8 a.m., just meet us right here in the tent stage Saturday. And uh, you can be a big part of putting that together. And then for the rest of you guys, those Christmas services are, are at uh, 9, 11, and 4.30. And we have these invitation cards. And uh, they're on the information table. There should be none left at the end of the service because otherwise they're going to go into the trash. So if you don't mind, pick up a stack of these. Make it a point this week that as you're going around town in the OBA area uh, and anywhere in the general Foley, a whole area up there, uh, Pensacola, be sure to be giving these out. Make sure every cashier, every waiter, every waitress, every neighbor, uh, everybody you know, and say, I have no gift for you this year, but here's a card. <laughs> there you go. Um, and uh, you hand those out and, uh, and invite everyone you can. It's really an opportunity for them to hear about Jesus maybe for the first time. And here's your way of doing that. Uh, you get them here, okay? Hey, we do it in this program, it's, and it's in your program. It's called Merry and Bright um, this year for Christmas. I'm really excited by this thing. So I want you to take a minute. If you've got a program, open it up to the middle there. It says Merry and Bright. Um, there's a real heartbreaking reality about uh, kids that are, they call it food insecure. They just don't know if they're going to have enough food. Um, and we're doing a program where we're making sure kids have food for Christmas. Um, and we figured out a, a way to do this for you very simple, and you can give to this program. We're also working with God Behind Bars uh, with the Scambia County up at uh, Blackwater Prison there. Uh, Blackwater Correctional Institute where we're reuniting families at Christmas so you guys are your donations are helping them buy gifts and then when the when the uh, kids show up at prison they've got gifts from their own parents the parents actually get to pick out the gifts that'll go to the kids but you guys are supplying the gifts through the Mary and Bright program man we are excited about this thing and you guys have been on fire for it for, for the last two weeks we had 232 kids adopted through this program so far that is significant. For, Our goal, though, is even more than that. So we're shooting for 550. So uh, we're about, uh, that would put us about 40-something percent. Uh, we'd like to get to 100% on that. And so if you, if you would like to help with this program, um, all you got to do is kind of follow the directions there. You can also just make it a, 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 a you know, check that doesn't add up to all that math. Um, and then write, if you're writing a check, write Mary and Bright on the memo line or put it in one of our giving envelopes, which are on our giving stations. There's one here, one on the other side of Keith there, of that tree, and then one outside on the way out. And to make it uber easy for the first time ever, we actually have, uh, we'll take plastic. So we have uh, credit card little portable things over here at that info table. The people wearing lights, 
Woohoo! You can punch in how many kids you want to sponsor, they'll swipe your card and, and you'll get an email with your donation receipt. And thank you so much for helping with that program. You really are helping kids. It's a very big deal to us. And we feel like when we, when we saw how much need is here, 550 would make a significant impact in this community. And uh, your giving will help. Thank you so much for that. Hey, um, so Service Saturday, I mentioned that, I mentioned that. Wait a minute, let me check. This is the dumb part where he's got to look at his notes. Okay, I think I did everything. We're good. Hey, I want to invite you to stand, and we're going to have our band rejoin us here in music here. Uh, why don't you find somebody you haven't met yet and shake their hand or say hello? Me and Brandon trying to sing joy to the world to you. You ready, buddy? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Gotta have my cape. <laughs> fans are excited Aaron Rodgers is back makes me sick <laughs> I'm a Vikings fan for those of you guys that don't know from Minnesota <laughs> uh, man whoa let's chill out a little bit folks <laughs> well my name is Dan I'm the pastor here at the floor band well, we're so glad you guys are hanging out with us yeah Merry Christmas, everybody. Are you guys ready for next week? Man, I'm so fired up. Wherever you're going to be, if you're not able to be with us, Merry Christmas. We pray your travels are safe. If you're in town and you're able to, we would love to see you out on the beach next week. It is going to be awesome. All three services are going to be a bunch of fun. 9, 11, and 4.30 sunset. It's going to be cool. Pray for great weather. The good news is, either way, our tent out there is going to have sides on it. In case it's windy or raining, we'll put them down. If it's not, we'll put them up. So it's going to be a beautiful time. Bring your families. We've got some fun stuff happening. Um, if you've got kids and you'd like them to be involved, um, our kids choir is going to be singing for us. And so that's going to be a bunch of fun as well. And I know John mentioned it, but how cool is it what's happening with our Mary and Bright with our kids, with incarcerated parents? I just, I mean, how awesome is that? I just was upstairs. And, uh, oh man, I, I can't talk about it too much. I get emotional, man. But um, I was just upstairs and uh, some mail had come in and somebody uh, from Tampa, Florida, um, I'm not even sure that we know them, uh, sent us a check to sponsor 10 kids. How awesome is that? Yeah. Oh man. 
So I want to say thank you guys for those of you that have been able to uh, give. Um, I know John told you there's ways to give today and all that, but just I just want to say thanks. It's going to transform some families' lives. And for a lot of these little kids, it's the first time they, um, that ministry, God Behind Bars, uses Christmas to, for the first time, introduce kids to their inmate parents. So for most of these kids, it's the first time they're meeting their parents. And so um, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty cool deal. So we've been talking talking about it every week as we've been going through this series that we've been calling Merry and Bright. If you've been in on it, we've been talking about Christmas for sure and all that comes with it, but we've been talking about a lot more than that. Christmas is one of those interesting holidays that brings um, friends and sometimes enemies together, right? Even for just a moment. Something interesting happened to me just two days ago. Uh, we always, especially during this season, we've always got uh, the trees like on 24 hours a day, you know, and we've always got Christmas music and we don't have um, a fireplace, so I just, Netflix has this great fake fireplace I put on the TV, <laughs> and it's got the real crackling sound. Someone needs to invent like a heater that attaches to your TV and shoots out heat, and then the smell in the air too, you know, like that uh, wood-burning smell. Shark Tank, somebody, Shark Tank. Um, and, uh, and I just popped it, I just grabbed the DVD and, you know, popped it in, and it was, it's a wonderful life. Like, who hasn't seen that? I realized my kids had never seen It's a Wonderful Life. A bad parenting on my part, you know? <laughs> my oldest is 11, so, you know, it's not like they're 20-something years old. They've never seen it. We haven't been depriving them or anything, but... Christmas is interesting. Um, I automatically think of my childhood when I was in Christmas season around my house, and uh, we had a very weird tradition when it came to Christmas in my family. I grew up in the uh, northern part of Minnesota, and uh, so Christmas, well, the great thing was always snow on the ground, right, which was awesome, and that meant to the neighborhood kids, we always played football out in the snow on Christmas, um, and, uh, but we as a family, we opened up our presents on Christmas Eve. Any Christmas Eve openers in the house? Yeah. There's a few of us, there's a few of us left, you know, and, um, but the weird thing was we would wake up and our presents would be out there, but we weren't allowed to touch them all day. Torture. I mean, like the, 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 like the greatest high ever as a kid and the biggest disappointment ever as a kid. I knew it, but it still disappointed me, right? We'd run out, whoa, and then we couldn't touch them until, at, until the nighttime. At night, we opened them at night because here's the weird tradition that my family was involved in. I don't know where it all started, but... If you've been around the church very long, you have found out that I didn't grow up in a Christian home as far as going to church. And so, but somehow, and we've all heard of people that attend, you know, services just on Christmas and Easter, CEO, Christmas, Easter only Christians, you know. Um, we weren't even that. We were like C Christians. Christmas only. Easter was not a thing for us. But here's what would happen. We would go to the Christmas, Easter you know, service at the church, but not attend it all year long. And somehow every year I ended up in the kids' Christmas production. I never attended a practice. I didn't know any of the songs. I did the watermelon thing. You know what I'm talking about? And I would always show up to church with a towel because I didn't know anything, so they just stuck me in there as a shepherd, right? I wrapped this towel around my head, you know, and they gave me this dress looking thing and a staff and just basically said, just shut up and stand there. Don't screw up our play. <laughs> then the kids would sing songs. You know. I don't know what was going on. So I don't know who my mom knew to get me in the production, but not attend a single practice or that church all year, you know? And so at the end, Another disappointment came my way. They would give us these really like cool decorated, some people from the church must have brown paper bags that when you open it, it was all candy on top. Like it was a Christmas gift for all the kids that did the production and all that stuff. So I'd grab it and I don't know why, but they fooled me every single year. I would get in my mom's vehicle, I would open it up and there's candy right on top. And I'm not talking like pretty good candy right on top. And we'd be eating it the whole way home. And then about halfway down, the, you know, there was like um, packings, you know, it was just like a separation of paper. We'd pull out the paper and I, I am not joking. The rest of the bag, at least a half of the bag was peanuts. <laughs> 
peanuts. Not shelled peanuts, in the shell, dirty peanuts. And every year I'd be so excited to open it up and I'm looking through this candy and the candy, 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 paper, peanuts. And when you get a bag that weighs that much and there's candy on top, as a kid, it's gold mine, you know? Jackpot. The whole half thing was peanuts. I was so disappointed every year. Who are these Christian people handing kids peanuts, fooling them, putting stuff that's very deceptive? <laughs> So we'd be pounding our peanuts, you know, on the way home. Don't throw those shells every year. Don't throw those shells on the ground, mom would say, you know. And um, so we're digging through and eating our peanuts, you know, very disappointed, leaving me and my three sisters. And then we get home, and we knew presents were when we got home. We were so excited every year. Now, it was tradition for us. So we'd rip them open at night, and then we'd have to go to bed, which was another great, I don't know what the heck my parents were doing. I think they set the whole thing up just as a joke, you know. Let's do this. When they wake up, they're going to see presents. Let's not let it open until the nighttime. And then when they open them up, they have to go to bed right away. It's like this whole scam my parents pulled on us, you know. They're laughing over there. <laughs> now they got to go to bed, you know. So taking out some kind of internal aggression from past lives on us, you know, or whatever. But um, so we waited for Uncle Joe to come over. My, one of my dad's brothers, he, out, he lived kind of near us, or sort of near us. You'll find that out in a minute. But um, Uncle Joe would come over and he would always have gifts or his gifts would already be there and we would we had to wait for Uncle Joe to get there. And we were so excited. We'd pull into our neighborhood and year after year after year we were so excited and Uncle Joe was never there when we got home. Never. I'm not even saying that as an exaggeration. I mean never. The dude is never home. But it was okay, right? Because he'll be here soon. When's Uncle Joe coming? Soon. It was always soon. Soon sometimes meant an hour. Soon sometimes meant three hours one year. Old Uncle Joe's on his way. When is he going to be here? Pretty soon. Now, this is before cell phones were a thing, so I can remember my dad getting off the phone. Boom. Hey. I was, it was Uncle Joe, he's on his way. Well, when you're eight or seven or five, on your way means you'll be here in a minute. Uncle Joe lived 90 minutes away from our house. <laughs> on his on our way, every car light, every motion outside, we'd run, it's Uncle Joe, it's not Uncle Joe. I spent my entire Christmas Eve being disappointed. No, it was actually a really great, a great time. But one particular year, this will tell you that the uh, kind of the generation that I grew up in, Nintendo was a big deal, right? The NES system. And there was a particular game that I really, really wanted. And there was a present when I woke up that morning, perfectly shaped like a Nintendo game. Perfectly shaped. I thought, yes. Now, there were other presents under the tree, but I was saving that one for last, right? I was so excited about it. I figured my sisters, they didn't care less about playing the Nintendo, so I knew how my evening was going to go. I was ripping open presents and playing the game. So I'm opening up other presents from my sisters. I don't care. Oh, uh, thanks. You know, thank you. But I've got my eye on one present. I got my Santa presents. I got my presents from mom and dad. I got presents from Uncle Joe. I'm trying to smile and care, you know, or make him at least think I care. And you've done that before, right? You've tried to make people think you care about what the trash they just gave you. Anyways. <laughs> just me? Oh, okay. Yeah. So there's the gift. And usually, you know how kids are, they want to save the big ones for last. No, not this one, it was about this big. I was so fired up, I ripped it open and it was in a, an unmarked box, so I thought, oh, maybe easier to wrap, right? So I opened it up and in where my game should have been was a wallet. <laughs> A wallet. I'm eight. I don't give a crap about some wallet. I ain't got no money to put in the wallet. So my uncle, very, very, like, he kind of recharged. I was, you guys, I'm still pissed about it. Anyway, so, anyway, so, I, I, um, I didn't think I still had the anger in me. But anyways, so... I open, the, I open this thing up and my uncle recharges my energy and goes, hey, never know, it might be some money in it. I thought, oh yeah. So right away my mind goes, oh, Uncle Joe bought me a wallet that was very nice and stuffed it with some cash, you know? So I was like, I hadn't thought about that far. I opened it up. No, Uncle Joe didn't buy me the wallet. He was just trying to like, he, I must have had this look on my face. 
and there was no money in the wallet. There was, however, a price tag that Santa forgot to pull out of the wallet for $9.99, you know? Disappointed. I was upset for obviously years, I guess, but I, I for sure was upset for weeks. Every time I saw that wallet, dude, I was like <laughs> angry about it. I gotta calm down, folks. I'm just Disappointment's a very interesting thing, isn't it? Because we can be disappointed about something like that that we thought was going to happen and it doesn't happen. We can be disappointed by something that we were expecting to happen and it never happens. And I don't know if you've ever been disappointed by someone before, but those moments can get really, really tough. They can get really tough. When someone that you know, you trusted, you loved, ends up doing uh, something that was out of character, or they do something to you, and, and it, sometimes it's not even that bad what they did to you. And sometimes it's not even something they did to you. Sometimes you find out about something about someone that is so disappointing, you're not sure that the relationship can ever be the same. You ever been disappointed like that? by someone, isn't that a horrible feeling? Disappointment is tough because what disappointment does is it sucks hope out of you. You, wa you almost want to trust the person so bad because you've got years of history together or whatever it is. Maybe they're a family member and you've known them literally your whole life and you kind of want to trust them. You want to be able to have faith in them, but they've disappointed you over and over and over again. So what do we do with our hope? We reserve it from people, don't we? We, sometimes we, we've been so disappointed, it's almost like, well, who are we really going to trust here? Who can we really place our hope and our faith and our, our trust in? So if we're not careful, we can end up being the type of people that disappointment is a driving factor in our lives. And we're automatically kind of withdrawn from ever wanting or being disappointed again. Disappointment will suck hope right out of your heart and right out of your life to the point where you have, I mean, I've talked to several people and maybe you have been there before. I know I have where it's like these relationships, it's like, well, forget, I'm kind of done with having close relationships because they seem kind of hopeless. Or maybe you've gone from like romantic relationship to a romantic relationship and you've even told yourself, I'm kind of given up because disappointment has sucked the hope out of your life. I've talked to people over and over and over again that are, they're so, uh, they're so frustrated because they're trying to get their career to work. They've gone this way and this way and this way. And it's almost like they've given up the dream of this certain career because they've been so disappointed. Disappointment will suck the hope out of your heart. Now there's this uh, very interesting character in the Bible who we know, we, we, would, uh, we call him King David or David, but David wasn't always king. David started out, we get introduced to David as this young kid who's a shepherd, and we have these writings that David wrote. They're songs and poems, and they've been collected, and they've been put in, almost right in the middle of the Bible in this book called Psalms. Now, there's 150 of these psalms. It's the longest book in the Bible. And there's some really, really short psalms, easy to read. Then there's a couple psalms that are really, really long, like Psalms 119. It's the longest chapter in all the Bible. And most, not all, but over half of those psalms were written by this kid who eventually became king of Israel named David. Now, David asks in one of his poems, in one of the songs that he writes, he asks this very interesting question Without using the word disappointment, he asked God a question about hope and disappointment. And I want to talk about that question a little bit. Well, let's read the question first. It's, it's right there in your program. It's in Psalms chapter 39. Now, you can go home and read the whole chapter for yourself. It's a great chapter. But we're going to read just the seventh verse together. Here's what it says. And so, Lord, so David is writing this as almost like a prayer, right? He's writing it like he's talking to God, this poem. Where do I put my hope? So that's the first question. Now, he answers his own question in the very next sentence, but basically he's saying, God, where, can I, where could I place my hope? That question is often asked by a person that has faced disappointment over and over again and gets to a place that's just like, 
well, I mean, I got, I've placed my hope in him and her and in that and in them, and I've been disappointed. So when it all comes down to it, where in the world could I place my hope? Now, here's his answer. It's a pretty definitive answer. He says, where, and so, Lord, where do I put my hope? My only hope is in you, talking to God. Now, that's a pretty definitive answer. That my only, the only hope I could ever have in the whole world is God. That's a pretty strong and uh, narrow answer to the question, where can I place my hope? And I think for some of us, the hope David's talking about and the hope sometimes we talk about are, are, are a little bit different. And here's what I mean by that. I'm, my youngest boy, his name is Obadiah. He's three years old. He's over across the street in our uh, children's church area right now. And, and Obadiah, since he was born, has had this blue blankie. You know what I'm talking about? Bankies or blankies, whatever the heck, you know? And um, it's this blue one and he loves it. Now, tonight... Here's what's going to happen. We're going to, you know, our day is going to be our day. And then at some point, we're going to lay that little guy down to bed. He sleeps on the bottom bunk. His older brother, uh, Enoch, is going to sleep on the top bunk. And um, the room is always the same. We've got one of those big, loud fans in his room. So they can't hear a thing. And they just go to sleep. You know what I mean? And so... Um, We've got, we'll have the fan going, and we're going to lay him down, and we pray as a family that we go into the room, we lay him down, and I'll lay with him for a minute, and we'll talk, and, you know, whatever we do with, you know, three-year-old conversations, and, um, and then I'll give him a kiss, and I'll tell him goodnight, dad loves you, and we, you know, we have these little conversations, and then I'm going to pull these, whatever, three, four covers up over him, I'm going to hand him his little blanket, his thumb's going to go right in his mouth, and he's going to go out, that dude falls asleep fast. He's out, right? Now, I could do the exact same thing tonight. I could have our prayer. We could have the fan on, the lights, the same, the same way they always are. I could pull the same number of covers up. I could uh, have a little, con our little three-year-old conversation together. I could give him a kiss. Daddy loves you, da-da-da. And I could not give him that blanket and it's like all hell is about to break loose for like 60 minutes until he's exhausted and passes out. You know what I mean? We've made the mistake of, you ever sometimes, I don't you know, whether it be um, if you have kids or maybe it's grandkids or it's a friend's kids or whoever, any little kids that you're around, um, you ever smell one of those blankets one time? Good Lord Jesus, you know? <laughs> It smells toxic at times. It's dry slobber, you know. We've made the massive mistake of right before he's going to bed or 30 minutes before he's going to bed, smelling like, whoa, buddy, we're going to wash this before you go to bed. I've made that mistake. My wife's smart for that. I've made the mistake, we're going to wash it. Then I go to lay him down. Buddy, it's okay. It's in the washer, and then we'll dry it. You'll have it in about 30, 40 minutes. The three-year-old, oh, okay, Dad. You know what I mean? <laughs> he don't know what I'm talking about. All he knows is he doesn't have it. Right? Now, he's getting up. Well, I want my blanket. He's crying and all that stuff, you know. The crazy thing is, everything's the same. The, it gets out of the dryer, which is the best, right? A blanket right out of the dryer. Oh, man, I hang on to it for about 10 minutes before I give it to him. <laughs> Just for that warmth. And then I give it to him. Bam. Thumbs in the mouth. He's out. Nothing was different. That stupid blanket ain't protecting him from some book. What are you going to slap the boogie monster with your blanket? Come on, man. That, the blanket doesn't actually protect him the way he thinks it does, does it? It's a security blanket, but it's all up here. right? I could explain to him all day, son, it ain't helping. You can fall asleep just as easily, right? But it doesn't work. Let me tell you what works. Giving him the dumb blanket. That works. Now, I did not throw that story. I'm going somewhere with this story. I did not throw that story out there to you so all of you parenting experts can come give me advice afterwards about how I shouldn't <laughs> let my kid suck his thumb or a, a blankie. I did that one time. I made the, the mistake of saying when we first had our first son, Abraham, that he the pacifier. He may have used it for like three weeks. He didn't like the thing at all. But for some reason, I, I said it in one of my messages. I had about 15 people line up afterwards um, instructing me in, in a better way to parent my son. You know what I mean? It was unbelievable. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm, I'm trying to be, you know... 
Christ-like. You know, oh, thank you. That's great advice. You know, oh, thanks. Great advice. I never thought of it that way. I mean, these people had all kinds of crazy opinions about what was going to happen. Probably end up in therapy when he's 40 because he had a nookie thing. when he. It's like, oh, my God. But I'm just trying to be loving. You know what I'm saying? I'm trying to be loving. Oh, I'm very disappointed in you. I don't even know you. What do you mean you're disappointed in me? You know? <laughs> But I'm telling you about 15 people came through and told me, I'm not, it might have been more than that, but about 15 people came through and told me how I should be parenting my firstborn child, you know? And I'm telling you guys, just between you and I, I lost it on number about number 13. <laughs> I lost it. I couldn't handle it anymore, man. Now I was young in Jesus, you know? I was a baby Christian. I didn't know any better at the time, but man, this lady came through. Now, I knew this lady. I knew this lady. I was actually her kids' youth pastor. So I knew the family pretty well. And she, like, you know, hey, come here for a second. Oh, Lord, here goes another one, you know? And I had had it. She tells me about how, I'm, um, you know, my kid's going to end up dependent on things. I thought, oh, my gosh. I heard, I've heard the same thing 13 times in a row. So finally, and I don't, you know, I probably needed to pray more that morning or something. <laughs> but I looked at that lady, and I said, I said, ma'am, I start out respectful, you know. Ma'am, I did not ask, and I'm trying to, I'm not trying to exaggerate what I said. I probably was a little bit more harsh with my tone, but I said, ma'am, I did not ask for your opinion, nor do I want it. And I, then I know, I know, folks, it gets worse. So here's what it, <laughs> so then I thought, that should have been enough, right? I should have just shut up, but I took another step. And I said, in fact, ma'am, I know your kids. I was her kids. I was her. I was her kids' youth pastor. I've known her kids for like three years. I said I know your kids because she was telling me in the story that oh my kids never had that you know they don't need that and all this stuff. I said I know your kids. If my kids don't turn out like your kids, that's a parenting victory. <laughs> Lord, I had to repent later, man. <laughs> it, brother. I, I don't even know what I said to the other two parents that came through. I don't want to know what I said to them. <laughs> Unsolicited parenting advice. The best. It's my favorite. So if you have something to say to me afterwards, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but sometimes we think of like God as like our, the hope that we place in God as like some security blanket that feels good in the moment, but at the end of the day, he doesn't do really anything for you, right? Now, he's going to grow out of that. He's not going to need that blanket at some point. He's not going to need it anymore. And then he's going to be like, you know, he's going to say to me, Dad, I didn't really need that blanket, right? It was, it was like a false hope. But if he likes it right now, that's great. That's all that matters to him right now is it makes him feel better. And that is not the type of hope I'm talking about. Christ, we don't, we don't place our hope in Christ's hands because it's a, it just makes us feel better for the moment. We don't place our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ so we can lay our heads on the pillow at night better. Remember that prayer that we prayed as kids? Maybe you didn't, but I learned. I didn't even know where I learned it, to be honest with you, because I didn't attend church for much. But now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. That's like a warped prayer, dude. That's like a five-year-old. Please, you know, if I die before I wake, you know. <laughs> Holy cow, man. Who's teaching five-year-olds this prayer, dude? If I die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. What the heck? <laughs> Five years old praying that prayer? But I listen, I prayed that prayer out of fear. Right? I was a kid like, oh, Jesus. You know? I guess if I don't wait, if I stop breathing at some point, take my soul, you know? That's intense prayer, man. And, and we do those types of things sometimes so that we can just lay our head on the pillow and have a peaceful sleep. But at the end of the day, I don't know if we really believe that we can really place our hope in God's hands. Now, this gentleman named Paul sat down one day. He's a devoted Christ follower. And he wrote a letter to some Christians in the city of Rome. And he addressed our hope. It's the very next verse in your program. It's in the book of Romans. It's in the New Testament. Great book to read. If you're looking for a place in the Bible to read, Romans is a really cool book. 
Here's what Paul says. I pray that God, I love these next four words, the source of hope. Come on, the source of hope. Will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Then, in other words, when you open up your life to God who is the source of all hope, then you will overflow with confident hope. There's a progression. Confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. See, through the power of the Holy Spirit means it's supernatural. You cannot muster it up on your own. Have you ever tried to get out of disappointment, tried to will it to go away and to be hopeful again? It's really, really difficult, if not impossible. It takes time and sometimes years for that disappointment to go away. Paul promises that confidence and that this confident hope will come supernaturally. When we place our faith in the source of all hope. Not someone who's got some hope and hopefully he does not run out. God, the source of all hope. God is not a security blanket for us that seems comforting at the moment but holds no power in the end. God is the source of all hope. And I don't know what disappointments that you have faced. I don't know. I'm assuming some pretty tough ones and some little ones that are kind of easy to get over. But my guess is, regardless of the level of disappointment you and I have faced, odds are, unfortunately, we're going to face disappointment again sometime in the future. Maybe not extreme, but maybe extreme. Maybe small. I don't know. But we're going to face disappointment again. And what can happen is disappointment starts to take root in our lives. And we live as a, like disappointment becomes a driving force. And then that disappointment sucks hope out of our lives. And Paul's encouraging us. He's encouraging all of us to place our hope, our ultimate hope, not in others, not in things, and not in circumstances, but instead in God because he is the source of all hope. In other words, in Christ, God will never disappoint you. That's good news. God will never disappoint you. He will never let you down. Now, we may not understand how and why and timing and all of that kind of stuff, but when it comes down to the end of it, he will not only give us joy and hope and comfort, like Paul says, but we can be confident in that hope. I'm not very confident with just a, my, you know, my son, his little blanket. There's no really confidence in that. It's just familiar, right? Soft makes him feel better, but there's no power in it. It's not going to do anything for him. It's not going to chase away any monsters or any robbers. It's not going to do anything for him. There's no confidence in it. When we place our hope in the one who is the source of hope, we can be confident that he will never disappoint us and he will never let us down. When we open up our lives to the source of hope, and we place our faith in him. Here's what we get. Here's what happens. Though we can't see it, we have a hope that God, God, would you forgive me of my sins, right? But then we can have confident hope. It's faith, basically, that I can't see it, but that your, our sins are actually forgiven past, present, and future. When we open up our lives to God, the source of all hope, we're forgiven of all wrongdoing. Now, you may not forget it, right? You may not forgive yourself. You may not be able to forget what you did. And you may have some other people in your life not letting you forget what you did. You know what I'm talking about, those people? They like reminded you of all your sins, you know? But God will never bring it up to you because he's forgiven it. And the Bible teaches us he forgets it. He casts it as far as the east is from the west, he says. You're forgiven. When we place our hope in Christ, he transforms our lives to the point where Jesus explained it like you're being born again. It's like you're a brand new person. The old is gone and the... Now, you may look the same, but you're different on the inside. That's the hope that is found in Jesus Christ, the source of all hope. That's good news, guys. That's good news. Yeah. Now, something else... Very interesting happens. 
Now, you, you may not see yourself this way. I want you to stay with me as we close out over just over the next minute or two because something else happens. When we open up our lives, when we, in other words, when we become a Christian, and if you're here today and you would not consider yourself a Christ follower, today can be your day. Today can be your day where you open up your life and say, Jesus, man, I believe you're God's son. I believe that you left heaven and you came to earth to die for me. I ask you to forgive my sins. I open up my life to you. Transform me. Amen. That's all it takes. Open heart to Jesus Christ. And if you have never done it, today is your day. You place your hope in the one who will never disappoint. And then here's what happens in return. We place our hope in Christ. And then in Colossians, the same writer of Romans, Paul says this to them. I'll explain them in a moment. God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles. The Gentiles were basically anyone. It was a generic name for any, um, any person that was not a follower of Jesus. The, the, the Hebrew, the Jewish people were worshipers of the one true God. And if you were not part of that group, if you had not come into that group to worship that one true God, the label on you was a Gentile, a non-follower of God. And so this mystery, this really cool thing that was happening was, God, Paul's letting them know, hey, this isn't just, this is for everybody. Everyone can open up their heart to God. Everyone can receive forgiveness, not just a select few people. Are the riches of the glory of the, here's the mystery of this mystery. Here's this crazy mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. For thousands of years, guys, for thousands of years, people have gone to a place to worship God. They'd go to the church or to the temple. They'd go somewhere because God, in their thinking, lived in buildings somewhere. So where do you go to worship God? Where do you go to sing to God? You go to the temple or to the church. Where do you go to hear um, someone teach you about God? You go to the temple or to the church. And it kind of became this idea. You could go to churches today and they'll say something like this. Isn't it good to be in the house of the Lord today? I don't know if you ever heard that before. Isn't it good to be in the house of God today? That is so far from biblical thinking. God doesn't live in temples or churches. He lives in us. It's a mystery. I, listen, Paul said it's like a mystery. So we can spend hours trying to talk about it, but Paul's like, hey, it's a mystery. I can't prove it to you. I can't cut myself and Jesus bleeds out. Like I, I can't show you evidence. It's a mystery, but something only by God's spirit, supernatural happens. When we place our faith and our hope and our trust in Jesus Christ, he then, the source of hope, comes to live in us. I've given my, my last uh, like 17, 18, 20 years to studying that Bible, and I'm not sure I can really explain what that all looks like, about how God himself, through Jesus, comes to live in us, other than it's some supernatural mystery. It's, a, it's an amazing miracle. But here's what happens. Here's the amazing thing. We take our hope, and we place it in the hands of Christ. He then, who is the source of all hope, comes to live in us. And then you and I are now, even if we didn't want to be, are carriers of hope to the world around us. Christ in you is hope to the world. I, I don't have any hope in and of myself. But, not to brag, but Jesus lives in me. And he's, he's the hope of the world. He's the source of all hope. And if you're here today and you're a Christ follower, you've opened your life to Jesus, you are carrying around. I can't explain it to you other than it's supernatural. You're carrying around not just hope. Living within you is the source of all hope. See, because there's a world around us, guys, that may not have the same hope that you and I have. They may have not placed their hope in Christ. So how are they going to ever find out about this hope? You and I. So every time we rub shoulders with somebody, every time we're around people, even if we didn't read, even if we're not even thinking about it, we're right there carrying the source of hope to the world 
on the inside of us. I've been to train myself over the years that I, there's someone in front of me. I was in at line at a grocery store just yesterday, and my first thought was, man, I wonder if anybody in this line needs some hope. That was a question I asked myself. Not because I'm some super, you know, spiritual person. I need to do it way more. But I thought, so I'm like eavesdropping in on people's conversations. and Just seeing if they need a little hope. Because I've got hope in me. I don't have hope, but there's hope living in me. And every time we smile and we hug, every act of service and of kindness and of love, that hope is bleeding out of us onto the world around us. I want you to leave here realizing this. You are carrying the greatest hope of humanity on the inside of you. That's how much God trusts you. You may not feel trustworthy. I don't. But he trusts you with great hope. I'm assuming there's some people in your neighborhood that might need some hope at one point of their life or another. Or at your workplace, at your office, at your building, at the store. And what you didn't know is that God had planted you right there. You didn't know it. You didn't sense it. You just needed some eggs. It was just a good deal on a condo. It was just a great deal on a house. You, you didn't know. But God knew, and he placed you, bam, right there. Because he said, that person, they're carriers of hope. And I need someone carrying hope in that neighborhood, in that building, in that office. I need someone carrying my hope today to that store, to that restaurant. You are a carrier of the source of hope that's found in Jesus Christ. I want us to change the way we think about ourselves. You're not hopeless. Your life is not hopeless. Your situation is hopeless. In fact, it couldn't be more hopeful. You have the source of hope in you. And I know and I understand that many of us are walking around today with some disappointments in my heart. My prayer today is two things as we close. Now, whatever disappointment that you've faced in life, that God will begin to work a healing in your heart. I love what the Bible says. There is nothing too difficult for him. And you've been hanging on to this appointment for years. Today's your day to let it go. You may not wake up tomorrow and all the disappointment's gone, but allow God to do the work of healing in your heart. And that all of us would leave this place today on a mission. Not to be a preacher, to be in a spotlight, not to stand at a corner of a street with a sign, and, but to be a carrier of hope to the world right around us. You know what Jesus told the disciples? As you go, share the gospel. Just as you go. You don't have to jump on a plane to do it. Just as you go throughout your day, deliver hope to the world around you. Would you bow your heads with me? We'll pray. Father, I am um, I'm grateful that you will never let us down. You will never disappoint us. But we can place our hope in you knowing sure well that you will not let it drop. You will not stab us in the back. You will not abandon us. You will not disappoint us. And God, I know there are some of us that are carrying a little disappointment or a lot in our hearts today. My prayer today is that you'd begin to heal those hurts, those wounds, those disappointments. And God, may we all place our true hope in your hands. And as we do that, God, it's a mystery, but you come to live on the inside of us so that we can be carriers of hope, weapons of hope to the world around us. God, may we be aware of those that need the hope that we have so we can share hope with the hopeless. We can share healing with the hurting. We can share love with those that feel lonely and forgotten. We can share peace where there's hate and prejudice and war because we are carriers of hope. We pray these things in Jesus' name. The Floribama family said, Amen. Amen. Thank you, Dan.
Hey, so today I need uh, need everyone to grab up some invites for Christmas off these information tables. Don't leave any behind. Hey, and also, don't forget, next Saturday, right here, 8 a.m., we'd love to see you. I'd like to invite everyone to stand right now. We say this every week. It's from Romans 8. If God is for us, who can be against us? We'll see you Saturday. Please help us with the chairs. Thank you.